Volume One, Chapter Fourteen of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume One, Chapter Fourteen. Vavasour, born to a splendid fortune, and left by the early death of his parents to the care of guardians, who, while they took sufficient care of his property, had very little influence over his mind and his morals, had never yet formed a wish which it was not immediately in the power to gratify. The growing inclination, therefore, that he found towards Celestina, was painful and uneasy to him, for he had too much honour and too true a regard for Willoughby to suffer a thought injurious to him to dwell on his mind, and he had been capable of entertaining wishes or forming schemes against his happiness. He knew that Celestina's attachment to him was not to be shaken, and that he should excite her contempt and abhorrence instead of continuing to enjoy the confidence and regard with which she now favoured him. But the more hopeless his partiality for her was, the more restless he, of course, became in its increase. For several days he endeavoured to conquer, or at least to conceal, it by redoubling his gaiety. He romped, laughed, and rattled till his violent spirits became even distressing to Celestina. All, however, would not do, and as he had no notion of enduring any kind of uneasiness, while there was a chance of relieving himself, he at length resolved to quit Willoughby, and not to return to him till after he was actually married, and this resolution he prepared to execute the following morning, which was the preceding one to that which was fixed for the marriage. "'I shall leave you this morning, George,' said he to Willoughby, as they were at breakfast together. "'Leave me!' cried Willoughby, in much surprise. "'For what reason?' "'Because I hate all formal ceremonies, and have besides business elsewhere.' ridiculous surely you are not in earnest perfectly so believe me never more in earnest in my life i'll come back to you in a week or ten days but i positively go this very day thou art a strange fellow and there is never any telling where to have thee did you not promise to be father to the brides what will celestina say why probably as you do that i am a strange fellow you make me uneasy harry said willoughby very gravely whimsical and unsettled as you are it must be surely something more than mere whim which urges you to leave me at such time not at all answered he gaily it is the time in the world you can best spare me and upon my soul i have business to do which i have foolishly neglected and which i must either go after now or a fortnight hence which when i intend to be with you and so my dear george will talk no more about it my servants are getting ready and will be at the door in a minute oh they are driving round well george god bless you my dear fellow Give my love to the girls, and tell Celestina to save me a great piece of bride cake. Willoughby would again have remonstrated, but Vazavsur, in his wild way, ran on rallying about him, about his marriage, and refusing to listen to him, till the curticle was ready, in which he stepped, again after again promising to return in a fortnight, and immediately drove away. Willoughby, though long accustomed to the starts of caprice from his thoughtless friend, was equally surprised and disconcerted 
at a resolution for which he could not account he was far from the remotest idea of the real cause and occupied as his thoughts were by celestina he investigated not so deeply the motives of his friend's actions as at another time he might have done on the preceding day moved his tender reproaches that she had no confidence in his honour and affected needless precaution celestina had acceded to his wishes that she would allow him as the day was fixed for thursday to fetch her to alverston in the morning of wednesday where jessie was to meet her and that she would then take her last leave of her humble abode on thorpe common as soon thereafter as Vassasur was gone, he dispatched Cathcart for Jessie, and hastened himself to Celestina, who was ready for him. As they journeyed towards the house that was henceforth to be their home, Willoughby, with more than usual tenderness in his voice and manner, entered into a more minute detail than he ever yet done of the plans he had formed for their future life with the sanguine hand of useful hope he drew a picture of uninterrupted felicity which celestina involuntarily sighing thought too perfect to be realized and with timid apprehension for which she could not account and was unwilling to betray she internally asked herself wherefore she could expect to deserve or enjoy blessings so much superior to the common lot of humanity all however that might have been to another an alloy to happiness was none to her so far as it related only to herself in marrying her willoughby had resigned all prospect of ever restoring his family to the splendid fortune and high consequence possessed by his ancestors nor could he even retrieve the estate he had left or keep up the place he was so fond of but by relinquishing all superfluous expenses and confining himself to that mode of life which was some years since adopted but would now be thought below the pretensions of a man possessed only of a thousand a year in fact willoughby found on a close inspection of his affairs that by living within that income he might in about ten years clear without dismembering his estate it is enough for happiness my celestina he would say it is enough to afford us all the decencies and all the comforts of life and to assist those who may not have either oh how little reason we have to envy those who have more celestina assented with her whole heart and even an uneasy reflection arose there for a moment representing that for her he resigned the splendour and luxury in which he might have lived she recollected her opinion of the greater part of those who moved amid a succession of those luxuries and asked herself whether there was one among them who was so much respected by others or so well content with himself as willoughby would probably be living as he proposed she remembered how often when she was accustomed to nearly many of those who by advantageous advances dazzle at a distance she had been compelled to assent to the truth of that severe expression of the satyrus which says that it may be seen of how small estimation is exorbitant wealth in the sight of god by his bestowing it on the most unworthy of all mortals the departure of vasivir of which willoughby had with some marks of regret and surprise on his first meeting celestina informed her had given her concern as it seemed to have been a disappointment to him but for herself she felt 
rather relieved by the absence of a too lively guest there was at times an unguarded vivacity about him of which she was not always able to check the excess and though she had never any idea of his partiality to her nor thought him capable of a serious attachment to any woman there had of late been a warmth and earnestness in his manner which she was afraid of being called prudish if she attempted to repress and yet she could not but feel that it was improper to allow it in her present situation and would be more so when she became the wife of willoughby on their arrival at elvenstone the lawyer was ready with the settlements they were immediately executed in the presence of cathcart and jessie and when that unpleasant ceremony was over a walk filled up the time till dinner nothing was ever so gay and happy as willoughby celestina was now mistress of his house his happiness was secured almost beyond the reach of fate and since only a few hours were to intervene before their marriage he tenderly chid celestina for her pensive gravity and endeavoured to engage her thoughts by necessary arrangements that he proposed in the house and by enlarging on those topics which she had listened to with so much complacency in the morning after dinner another walk was proposed but just as they were rising from table a servant entered with a letter for willoughby which he said had been brought express from exeter he broke the seal which like the hand of the direction was unknown to him he ran over the contents hastily changing countenance as he read and then inquiring if the messenger waited hastily left the room celestina who watched his looks was alarmed both by them and his manner of leaving the room a moment's reflection subdued her apprehensions but they were presently renewed and heightened by his sending to speak with cathcart who after being with him almost a quarter of an hour returned by his directions to inform her that he was gone on horseback to exeter to meet some people who had sent to him about business which would admit of no delay he begged cathcart to tell her that it would be soon dispatched and that he should certainly return in a few hours celestina knew from his own account every circumstance of his fortune she knew that except the mortgages on his estate the interest of which had been punctually paid he had no pecuniary claims to answer but his debt to vassiver she was equally certain that he had no dispute with anybody and that therefore it could not be an affair of honour and she thought it certain that if lady molyneux or any of his relations had been in the neighbourhood he would have made no mystery of their arrival his abrupt departure therefore without seeing her surprised and troubled her and neither her own reason which urged how unlikely it was that any disagreeable business should detain him or the arguments of cathcart and jessie could quiet or mitigate the anxiety which every moment of his absence increased four five six hours had now passed by celestina while it was light in traversing the avenue and the road that led towards exeter and after it became dark in listening at the door to every noise it was ten o'clock a still starlit night a low wind conveyed now the distant murmur of the waterfall in the park now the voices of men from the village where everything soon sunk into repose neither cathcart nor jessie could longer disguise their fears though neither knew what to dread 
but while they affected to believe Celestina's apprehensions in great measure groundless, their anxious returns to the door to listen, their restless inquietude and various conjunctures convinced her too evidently that they participated the fears they pretended to condemn. At length, about eleven o'clock, a horse, or as they were willing to believe horses, were heard to come fast along the road. The park gate opened and shut with violence. It was Willoughby, they all fondly hoped. All ran out eagerly, impatient to meet him. As the horsemen approached, however, they distinguished him to be not Willoughby, but the servant who had attended him. "'Where is your master, Hugh?' said Celestina. "'Is he coming? Is he well?' The man took a letter from his pocket and answered in a dejected tone. "'No, madame, not coming. He sent me with this letter to Mr. Cathcart.' Celestina followed trembling, while Cathcart ran into the hall, and by the light which hung there read these words. "'Dear Cathcart, come to me immediately. I shall not return to-night. I know not if, but assure Celestina of my safety. Lose not a moment in coming to yours ever, G. W. Swan Exter, Wednesday night.' The painful surprise Celestina had before endured was happiness and ease in comparison of the vague but terrible apprehensions that now seized her. What could detain him against his wishes? What meant the unfinished sentence? I know not if. What could he want with Cathcart? And why not disclose the cause of his stay, and his business with Cathcart, if it was only an affair of little consequence, since he could not but know how much his sudden departure must alarm her. The note, too, seemed to have been written with a trembling hand. The lines were crooked, and the letters hardly formed, and the paper blotted. All denoted hurry and confusion, very unlike Willoughby's manner in matters of mere business, and the indications of some impending evil alarming enough in themselves, were exaggerated by the terrors which had now taken entire possession of the mind of Celestina. Unable to restrain her emotions, she ran, hardly knowing whither she went, to the stable, where the servant who had brought the note was getting ready the horse on which Cathcart was to go. She eagerly questioned the man who was with his master. He answered that he did not know, that he saw nobody with him, but he had heard at the inn that two ladies had come thither that morning, who had sent the message to Alvinstone, that he believed they had been with his master, but he did not know, and when his master spoke to him and gave him the letter for Mr. Cathcart, he was alone and seemed very uneasy, saying, however, little more to him than to desire he would make what haste he could. This account served only to increase the terrible obscurity which tormented Celestina. A thousand other questions occurred. Were these ladies yet at the inn? Did they travel in their own chaise? Had they servants with them? Hugh could not answer the first question, but the other two being such as lay more within the reach of his observation. He answered that there were certainly neither servants nor horses at the inn belonging to any stranger when he came away. Cathcart was by this time ready, and seeing the extreme inquietude of Celestina, he assumed the appearance of tranquillity he was far from feeling, and that it was probably some business relative to Mr. Willoughby's estates, which had been overlooked and neglected, that at all events he would be back in a few hours when it was almost certain that if Mr. Willoughby did not return himself, he should be commissioned fully to acquaint her of the reasons of his detention, 
and convince her that her fears for his safety were groundless. In the meantime he besought her to endeavor to quiet her spirits and to take some repose. Cathcart then departed, and Celestina, leaning on the arm of Jessie, returned to the house, but to follow the advice he had given her, was not in her power, the little she had gathered from the servant served to awaken new alarms, not less painful, though very different from those which had at first assailed her. Then she had a confused idea that the abrupt departure of Vazivur had been occasioned by some misunderstanding between them, which had produced a challenge. It was unlikely, but it was not impossible. Now she gave up that conjecture for another, and supposed that Willoughby might have formed some connection or engagement with some woman, who, hearing of his intended marriage, had thus prevented it by urging her prior claim to his hand. This supposition was, however, more improbable than the other, from his known integrity and unblemished honour, from his long and tender attachment to her, and from the whole tenor of his morals and his conduct. But however unlikely, it was not quite impossible, and the anxious and alarmed spirit of Celestina ran over the remotest possibilities, but found in all only exchange of anguish. As Cathcart had promised to return in a few hours, Celestina, certain of not being able to sleep, would not go to bed, and Jessie, who shared all her solicitude, as the time approached that Cathcart had named for the probable period of his return, they were again both at the window, and again eagerly listening to every noise. The sun arose, but discovered not the objects of their solicitude, and Celestina, now unable to rest within the house, besought Jessie to go down with her to the end of the long avenue of elms and onto the road, as if the attempt to meet those they expected rendered the suspense less distracting. Weary of conjecture and fatigued both in mind and body, they moved slowly and melancholy along. Neither of them spoke, for neither had any comfort to offer the other. Of the laborers who were come by this time to their work, they inquired if they had heard of their master or seen Mr. Cathcart on the road, but no intelligence could be gained of either. The peasants, however, alarmed by the questions and by the looks of those who asked them, all eagerly offered to go anywhere, to do anything their master's service might require, and begged Celestina to employ them, but though she had several times during the long and anxious night thought of sending a messenger with a letter to Willoughby, or even of going herself, she now remembered that all the intelligence she could gain from the first expedient she would probably receive from Cathcart before any messenger could get to Exeter, and for the second that it might be displeasing to Willoughby were she to appear thus prying into his actions and mistrustful of his honour. Nothing, therefore, remained but to bear with what firmness she could, suspense, which every moment rendered more insupportability cruel. Hardly conscious of what she was doing, and insensible of personal fatigue, she had advanced near a mile beyond the park, and had partly crossed a sandy heath, over which the high road lay, when Jessie hastily cried out that Cathcart was coming. He saw them at the same moment, and hastened on, leaped from his horse as soon as he came near them. His countenance was little likely to quiet their fears. He was as pale as death, and his lips trembled as he spoke to Celestina, and assured her in a voice that seemed to contradict the words it hardly articulated, that Mr. Willoughby was well, perfectly well, 
and had authorized him to say everything to her that might make her easy the hurried manner in which he spoke this the impression of uneasiness on his countenance and the improbability that willoughby should be well and not return himself all struck forcibly on the mind of celestina and convinced her that something very fatal had happened you deceive me cathcart cried she in the wild and tremulous voice of despair i know you deceive me something very dreadful has befallen him he is dead or dying i will go to him however i will know the worst cathcart now took her hands and with the utmost earnestness began again to repeat his assurances that willoughby was not only alive but well celestina interrupting him asked why then do i not see him why is he detained and what business of fatal import could keep him so long cathcart i will not i cannot be deceived tell me at once what i have to suffer and i will endeavour to bear it but this intersitude these apprehensions i cannot endure another hour nor another moment while this dialogue passed he had taken one of her arms within his and having made a sign to jessie to take the other they led her gently towards elveston park gate cathcart was silent for a moment as if considering how he could soften the shock which was necessary for him to give her while celestina continued impatiently urging him to tell her the worst whatever it might be let me repeat to you dearest madame said he let me repeat to you that you have nothing to fear for the life of our dear friend and surely whatever other intelligence i have to impart other intelligence cried celestina you have then something to impart which all my fortitude is required to sustain willoughby but no it is impossible he cannot be unworthy he cannot have cruelly deceived me it is impossible it is indeed replied cathcart in my opinion impossible for mr willoughby to be guilty of any unworthy action you miss de Marais, have i am convinced a strength of understanding very uncommon cathcart cried celestina with energy this is no time for flattery prove your opinion of my understanding by daring to entrust me with this fearful secret the knowledge of it cannot give me so much pain as your hesitation i would very fain obey you replied he what then will you say if i tell you that though i am wholly ignorant of the cause of a resolution so extraordinary so unexpected i am afraid it will be very long before you see willoughby again and that he is now many miles distant from us though upon my soul by all my hopes here and hereafter i swear that i neither know the motives of his departure nor whither he is gone celestina prepared as she was for some heavy blow found this hideous uncertainty more than she could sustain that willoughby should have quitted her probably for ever without assigning any cause at the very moment they were to be united that he should not himself have seen her to have softened the pain this cruel and unaccountable event must inflict that he should not even have written to her but should in this abrupt and unfeeling way abandon her to all the misery of endless conjuncture regret and disappointment were circumstances so unexpected so insupportable that her reason which would have sustained her in almost any other exigence seemed for a moment to yield to this she became extremely faint her knees trembled a cold dew hung on her forehead and all the effort she could make was to signify by a motion of her hand that she could go no farther 
they were then more than half a mile from the park gate but the road along which they were passing was worn and a bank on either side offered her a seat cathcart and jessie sat down by her both silent and almost as much affected as she was she leaned her head on jessie and, and after a moment a deep sigh a little relieved her she turned her eyes mournfully on cathcart with an expression he perfectly understood as seeming to say tell me all and i will try to endure it do not think i conjure you my dear madame continued he that the ardent and tender affection of mr willoughby for you is diminished were it possible for me to do justice to the agonies i saw him in when he told me that a strange necessity a necessity he could not explain compelled him to quit you if language could describe the wretchedness in which he seemed to be involved do not describe it dear cathart said celestina speaking with difficulty i can bear my own misery terrible as it is better than the thoughts of his mitigate his sufferings then admirable miss de moray interrupted cathcart by collecting all your fortitude and remembering how much reliance you ought to have on his honour and his affection and let me be able to say when i write to him that this sad separation has not injured your health nor your opinion of him believe me such is the only intelligence that can administer any consolation to the torn heart of my noble friend i will try then cathcart that he shall have it you know where to write to him he expects to hear from you and from me he wishes not to hear he told me resumed cathcart that as soon as he was able he would write to you himself that he was going immediately to london whither he should go afterwards he knew not but that a hateful mystery then he stopped seemed to repent having said so much charged me to assure you of his everlasting affection started from his seat walked about the room wildly then again repeated his charge to me that i would not leave you or suffer jessie to leave you but that you would remain at alverstone till you heard from him again he hesitated doubted and wringing my hand asked me with disturbed looks in a tremendous voice if ever wretchedness equalled his i would have besought him to tell me from whence it arose but as it foreseeing whither my inquiry would tend he stopped me cathcart cried he you know i have great confidence in you and that i would entrust you with this fatal mystery which i go now to clear up but i have sworn never to divulge the cause of my what can i say o oh, celestina best and loveliest of human beings what must be those sufferings which willoughby dares not communicate to you which your pity and tenderness again he broke off and hurried out of the room he returned however in a few moments somewhat more calm and alarmed as i had been by his agitation by the wild eagerness of his manner and the incoherence of his words i thought it better to soothe him than obtain an explanation which it cost him so much even to speak of i contented myself therefore with assuring him of my implicit obedience to all his commands and of my conviction that whatever might be your distress and anxiety you would acquiesce in all his wishes and that your reliance on him your affection for him would not be shaken by this involuntary separation which dear sir continued i will surely be temporary only i was going on but he checked me i know not said he with quickness i know not involuntarily god knows it is 
but when it will end o celestina is this the day which i have with so much delight anticipated he now struck his open hand on his forehead again started away from me and again relapsed into all the agonies of sorrow celestina had not hitherto shed a tear stunned by the greatness and singularity of her misfortune terrified by the evil which its obscurity rendered doubly fearful her senses were for some moments suspended but willoughby weeping and in despair willoughby torn from her by an invisible and resistless hand awakened all her tenderness and tears filled her eyes as with a deep sigh she cast them towards heaven and with clasped hands and in a faint voice cried wherever he goes whatever he does may god protect and bless him and if the remembrance of poor celestina causes him any unhappiness may he forget her indeed cathcart added she indeed his happiness and not my own has been always the first wish of my heart she would have gone on but her voice failed her after a moment's silence however she seemed to have found some degree of fortitude and strength let us return to the house my dear jessie said she while i am able and let us consider what it will be right to do cathcart glad to see her more composed than he had dared to hope now again led her forward with the assistance of jessie but their help seemed no longer requisite she hurried on with as much quickness as if she expected her suspense to be terminated on her reaching the house where she arrived out of breath trembling and agitated she spoke not but hurried through the hall into the library where they usually sat and there the first object that struck her was mr thorold the clergyman who had been engaged to marry them the same who had at the request of willoughby so effectually exerted his zeal and friendship in introducing jessie woodburn to her grandfather and of whose society willoughby was very fond he laid down his book on the entrance of celestina and prepared to salute her with cheerful congratulations for it was not now more than eight o'clock he had put his horse into the stable himself as was his custom and walked into the library where he had been some time expecting willoughby and began to wonder as he was a very early riser as his delay all ideas of bridal festivity however were driven from his mind the moment he beheld the countenance of celestina my dear miss dormoray cried he approaching her are you ill has anything happened celestina struck by the sight of him could not answer but sat down in the first chair she found and cathcart seeing how greatly she was affected took mr thorold took mr thorold by the arm and led him into the garden celestina in the meantime leaning against jessie who hung weeping over her attempted again to recover her resolution and composure she sighed deeply jessie my love said she when she could command her voice i wish to return to thorpe heath methinks i am now an intruder here send therefore for some conveyance for me and think for me my dear friend for i fear i am incapable of judging for myself the timid and soft-tempered jessie was but little likely to direct or support her let us dear madam said she speak to cathcart again before you take any resolution let us hear mr thorold's opinion do you then attend them for that purpose replied celestina for myself i cannot hear them i should i think be better where i left alone for a few moments 
I will go, therefore, to my own room. My own room? Alas, I have none in this house. Let me go, however, Jessie, to that which I used to call mine. I would recall my dissipated and distracted spirits. I would acquire some degree of reason and resignation, and since wretchedness is now irrevocably mine, I would teach this rebellious heart to submit to it. Jessie answered not, and Celestina, rising, walked slowly through the hall, leaning on her friend's arm, towards the staircase. As she passed, she saw Willoughby's hat and gloves on the table where he generally placed them, a book he had been reading to her, as they sauntered into the garden the preceding day, lay by them. Celestina started as if a spectre had met her, the painful contrast between her present situation and that of a few hours before struck her forcibly. She shuddered, and snatching up the book, hastened away with it, as if she apprehended somebody would take it from her. When they reached the door of the apartment which she had chosen for her dressing room, she turned to Jessie, and with a melancholy and forced composure bade her adieu for an hour. "'You will go, my dear,' said she, to Mr. Thorold and Mr. Cathcart, and say to the former, with my compliments, that I will endeavour to see him if he will be kind enough to stay till ten o'clock, and breakfast here, and tell him, too, that I depend much on his friendly advice, and that it cannot be given to any being who wants it more or will be more sensible of its value. End of Volume 1 Chapter 14 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of Volume 1volume two chapter one of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jennifer painter celestina by charlotte turner smith volume two chapter one the reflections of Celestina, when she was alone, were full of bitterness and anguish. It was in vain that she wearied herself with conjectures on the cause of her misfortune. She could find no probability in any that presented themselves. It could not be caprice, nor that cruel delight which men have sometimes taken in wantonly inflicting pain and torturing by disappointment the hearts they have taught to love them for of such conduct she knew Willoughby to be incapable. It could not be a dispute with Vavasor or any other young man, for such, however alarming, must soon have been decided. Nor could it be any pecuniary difficulty that had thus divided them, since Willoughby, in talking over their future prospects, had related to her the situation of his fortune with the utmost clearness and precision. It could hardly be a prior matrimonial engagement, for, from his infancy, he had loved her. He had repeatedly told her that he never had the least partiality for any other woman, and he was truth and candour itself. It could not be any impediment raised by the Castle Norths, for however great might be their displeasure and disappointment, they had no power over Willoughby's actions and he did not love them well enough to make it probable that their persuasions or remonstrances could induce him to give up the favourite project of his life, and abandon her, whom he so passionately loved, to disgrace and misery. Whatever was the cause, however, of the sudden resolution he had taken, misery was certain. She observed that in the dialogue which Cathcart repeated, as having passed between him and Willoughby, 
no mention was made of a probability of his return no hope thrown out that their union was rather suspended than put an end to all was dark and comfortless and in the mystery which surrounded the whole affair there was something of terror and apprehension which seemed more insupportable than the certainty of any evil except willoughby's death cathcart however had given her a motive to support her courage in telling her that nothing but the knowledge of her bearing his loss without injury to her health or her affection for him could soothe or diminish the anguish with which willoughby was himself oppressed let me endeavour then said she to give him this satisfaction as the last proof i shall perhaps ever be able to give him of my tender my unalterable love condemned as i am to everlasting regret dashed from the summit of happiness to long and hopeless sorrow for the rest of my life let my resolution in suffering with calmness show that i should have deserved the happiness which heaven once seemed to have settled as my lot heaven only knows wherefore i am condemned to lose and lament it the solemn promise which willoughby had owned his mother had asked and received of him in her last moments now occurred to her perhaps it is for the intended breach of that promise cried she that we are punished yet from whence the ear that heard it the anxious maternal heart that obtained it a dust my benefactress comes not from the grave to claim it it was known only to her to her son and to me who is there who could enforce it now and to whom would willoughby listen after obviating all the objections i urged against its violation this fatal promise however had always hung heavy on the heart of celestina even in her happiest moments and she seemed now to be paying the price of having ever consented to break it still still the inexplicable mystery remained and the hand from which the blow came that had divided her and willoughby was equally hid in obscurity when a misfortune however heavy is certain the mind sinks resistless beneath it and feeling all remedy ineffectual it ceases all attempt to apply any but this was not the case with celestina while the cause of her being torn from willoughby was unknown there appeared a possibility that it might be removed and though he had held out no such hope in his conversation with cathcart her reason now seized this idea as her only resource he had besought her to bear their separation with patience he had hopes then surely that it would end he had entreated her not to forget her affection for him surely he had expectations then that he might again claim it a sanguine temper encouraged these faint rays of comfort which a few moments before seemed to be extinguished for ever the first shock was past the tears she had shed had relieved her overburthened heart and she prepared with some degree of serenity to go down to mr thorold cathcart and jessie and to consult with them on what she ought to do when she again entered the room the little group which were assembled in it their melancholy and anxious looks and the different expectations with which their meeting had been appointed combined to affect her and to shake the little resolution she had with so much difficulty acquired she sat down however and mr thorold with a degree of fatherly tenderness approached her and took her hand my dear young friend said the excellent man this dignified composure is worthy of your excellent understanding do you think me deserving the honour of being your adviser if in the present state of circumstances you feel that you want one 
i do indeed severely feel replied celestina faltering the necessity of a friend who is able to advise me and where dear sir can i find one so equal to it if you will but undertake the trouble well then replied mr thorold we will not go over the occurrences that have happened nor attempt to account for them some unforeseen events have divided you and my friend willoughby and i am very sure that whatever they are they must if irretrievable embitter the rest of his life he wishes you as i understand from mr cathcart to remain here at least till you have letters from him do you intend to do so i hardly know answered celestina faintly what i ought to do it seems to me said mr thorold that whatever reason has had so much influence on him as to compel him to quit you should render your abode in his house improper i will return then sir since that is your opinion to the lodging i left at thorpe heath that will be very melancholy and unpleasant to you i fear it certainly will but what have i to do now but to learn to suffer local circumstances will have little power to add to the sorrow i must endure while uncertain of what is to become of mr willoughby doubting whether i may not have been the cause that some evil has befallen him and sure of nothing but that i must be wretched if i never see him again i would very fain comfort without deceiving you if i could i hope you will see him again yet nothing surely but some very extraordinary event could have taken him from you but you hear that he was well that he promised to write to you it is possible that letter may explain what all our conjectures can do little in clearing up let us leave them therefore and do you my dear miss de mornay resolve to fulfil his parting injunctions as far as prudence will permit i cannot say i approve of your staying here or of your going back to indulge your uneasiness in the mournful seclusion of your cottage let me propose therefore a middle way by which you will receive this expected letter without quitting the neighbourhood and be ready to obey any wish of our dear willoughby without receiving it at thorpe heath where you would have nobody to assist you in its execution will you go home with me celestina who already felt the value of such a friend as she seemed to have acquired in mr thorold and who foresaw that she must lose jessie who could not stay long from her grandfather would willingly have embraced this offer she knew that willoughby had the warmest friendship for mr thorold and that he would probably approve of such a proposal but she was unacquainted with his wife and dreaded to intrude herself into a family where she might find only the master of it disposed to receive her she objected therefore to the trouble she should give and to the impropriety of introducing herself thus unasked to the acquaintance of his lady but mr thorold obviated all her objections assured her she should have an apartment to herself and that his wife would consider her as his daughter his daughter as her sister and celestina who could not think without pain of going alone to thorpe heath which she had left with prospects so very different and from whence her books and clothes had been removed consented to go with mr thorold and to remain with him at least till she heard from willoughby it was then settled that at least part of the original errand which had brought mr thorold to alverston should be completed and that cathcart and jessie should be married since her father was already waiting to give her away and since cathcart was to remain at alverstone by the particular directions of willoughby on their parting celestina could not be present at the ceremony but while it was performing prepared herself with as much resolution as she could for her little journey when they returned from the altar 
she kissed in silence the weeping Jessie, who clung round her, unable to bid her adieu. She recommended to Cathcart the closest adherence to every injunction laid on him by Willoughby, and besought him to come himself over to her with the expected letter as soon as it arrived. And then, with faltering steps, went to the chaise which was in waiting for her by Mr. Thorold's orders. He placed himself by her, and she was thus removed, probably as she thought for ever, from the house of which, only a few hours before, she considered herself as the fortunate mistress. As she passed along the avenue, the bench under one of the great elms, where she had so often sat with Willoughby in their childhood, and where only a few days before he had been recalling those delightful times to her recollection, struck her most. It looked like a monument to the memory of lost happiness. As the great gate of the park shut after the carriage, she felt exiled for ever from the only spot in the world that contained any object interesting to her, and though little disposed to think of poetry, almost involuntarily repeated, Oh, unexpected stroke, worse than of death, must I then leave thee paradise, thus leave thee native soil, these happy walks and shades? Mr. Thorold, to whom sorrow was sacred, attempted not to call off her thoughts from their present mournful employment, but glad to see that her sorrow broke not out in those violent and convulsive expressions which many women would have given way to, he contented himself with administering to her in silence all the offices of friendship. And when they arrived at his house, which was about five miles from Alverston, he got out and went in first to prepare his family for the reception of their unexpected visitor. After a few moments he returned, and assured her that both Mrs. Thorold and his daughter would be happy to see her, and think themselves honoured by her abode with them. But, added he, perhaps you had rather go to your own chamber than be introduced immediately to strangers? Celestina, had already repented of having accepted Mr. Thorold's offer, however friendly it was, and felt that in her present state of mind the most forlorn solitude would have been better for her than the restraint she must unavoidably submit to, and the inquiries that, if not by words, the looks of all who saw her would make into the cause of the strange revolution that had happened in her circumstances but it was now too late to retreat, and she determined to go through at once a ceremony, the delay of which would not render it less distressing. She answered, therefore, with more steadiness of voice than could be expected, that she could not too soon avail herself of Mrs. Thorold's kindness, and was immediately introduced to her and her only unmarried daughter. Mrs. Thorold, was what the world agrees to call a very good sort of woman, but one of those who are best described by negatives. She had no positive failings, but a sort of feminine pride, which made her very anxious that none of her neighbours, at least none of the rank of private gentlewoman, should have handsomer clothes, or better furniture, or a nicer house, and while she carefully guarded her own dignity, she indulged somewhat too much curiosity in inquiring into the minutest particular by which the consequence of others could be diminished or increased. Mr. Thorold, whose strong understanding taught him to see and bear her foibles, had taken the utmost pains to check in his daughters a propensity to imitate them. The three elder had been married some years, and were settled in the neighbourhood of London. Arabella, the youngest, was now about two and twenty, rather pretty in her person, and pleasing in her manners. With much of her father's sense, she had a little of the vanity of her mother, but it had taken another turn. Though she dressed fashionably, 
and her sisters always took care by sending her the newest modes from london to enable her to give the ton in that remote country she piqued herself less on that advantage than on being reckoned extremely accomplished in consequence of this rage she played on several kinds of instruments mechanically for she had no ear and sung in a feigned voice for nature had denied her a natural one in languages she was more successful under the instruction of her father she had early been taught latin and that knowledge facilitated her acquiring the french and italian which she wrote and understood better than she spoke them she took likenesses in crayons painted landscapes in oil and the apartments were furnished with her worsted works and embroidery celestina had hardly gone through the first ceremonies of her reception than she found a relief from the inquisitive looks of the mother and daughter in admiring these performances you do my trifling productions a great deal of honour said miss thorold and your praise cannot fail of being very gratifying to me as i understand you are yourself so extremely accomplished indeed answered celestina you have been misinformed i can boast of no such advantage but i am extremely fond of music and of drawing and used to please a very partial friend by attempting them since her death my time has passed in a very unsettled way and i now have no motive to tempt me to recover what in that desultory life i have lost of the little i knew miss thorold who had heard celestina represented as excelling was not sorry to find she possessed no such very great advantages over her and celestina to whom anything was preferable to conversation pressing her to sit down to the harpsichord she complied with that air of confidence which the certainty of excelling gives and till dinner she continued to play sonatas and lessons all of which celestina failed not to applaud though she had so little idea of what she heard that she could not have assigned one to its proper composer her thoughts were fled after willoughby and from the strange reverse she had experienced nothing had power to detach them dinner tea and supper at length were over the presence of mr thorold prevented his wife from asking questions which were every moment rising to her lips and celestina was permitted to retire to her own room at an early hour the extreme fatigue she had suffered the night before and the solicitude of spirit she had endured for so many hours had so exhausted nature that she sunk into slumber but it was disturbed and broken by hideous dreams in the morning however she found herself better her mind had not yet recovered from its consternation but she could now think of all that had happened with more steadiness in the letter she expected from willoughby she had something to look forward to which might alleviate but could not increase her anxiety as whatever cleared up the mystery would she thought be a relief to her and certainty however painful she was sure she could endure better than wild conjectures and terrifying suspense End of chapter 1volume 2 chapter 2 of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter celestina by charlotte turner smith volume 2 chapter 2 all the following day passed without any tidings of cathcart in search of whom the anxious eyes of celestina were continually turned towards the window mr thorold went out to his farm and among his parishioners in his usual way and had charged his wife to let celestina be mistress of her time and not to importune her with questions or even with conversation 
to arabella also he had given the same injunctions but the native politeness of celestina had made both the ladies believe she was pleased by their conversation and interested in their concerns and to avoid the appearance of rudeness or singularity celestina now forced herself into some degree of attention to their endeavours to entertain her listened to the details mrs thorold gave of the affairs of the neighbourhood and gave her daughter her opinion of the most elegant mixture of colours in a work-bag she was composing for one of her sisters heard with patient politeness a long poem written by young thorold who was now at oxford and assented to the justice of arabella's complaints that there was very little rational society in the country that everybody now forsook their distant seats to pass their summers at some watering-place and that unless one could enter into the amusements of an inferior circle there was to be found in the country no amusement at all so passed the long long day and another and another in the same manner relieved by nothing but the silent though tender sympathy with which mr thorold himself seemed to enter into the feelings of his fair unhappy guest he looked at her with eyes that told her all the concern her situation gave him and appeared hurt that both his wife and daughter though they behaved to her with all the attention and kindness possible seemed not to understand that on a mind like hers in its present situation the common occurrences of life could not be obtruded but to pain and fatigue he however spoke not to them of what he feared they had not delicacy of feeling enough to comprehend but knowing of the expected letter from willoughby he became towards the noon of the fourth day almost as anxious for its arrival and almost as uneasy at its long delay as celestina herself her solicitude was by that time becoming insupportable she could no longer conceal it under the appearance of attending to her hosts but took the opportunity of mrs thorold's being engaged in domestic business and arabella at her music to steal into the garden where she hid herself in a sort of alcove cut in a hedge of holly and other evergreens that bounded the garden towards the road and there gave way to the tormenting apprehensions that corroded her heart it was now tuesday willoughby had been gone since the preceding wednesday evening and had he gone to london immediately and written from thence as he promised the letter must long since have reached cathcart by the return of the post but she knew that unless he was greatly changed it was not to the post he would entrust the conveyance of a letter on which her existence perhaps depended the delay therefore aggravated all the terrors she felt but another day passed and she was still obliged to endure them to disguise her distress however was impracticable and without hoping to impose upon her friends by so common an artifice she was at length compelled to say that she had a headache which was very severe unless when she was in the open air and that she was rendered by it quite incapable of conversation having thus obtained the liberty of wandering alone in the garden she passed there the whole morning of wednesday sometimes reflecting with the bitterest regret on the different prospects which were before her on the wednesday of the preceding week and sometimes bewildering herself in conjectures on the cause of their having thus vanished from her spring had within that period made a rapid progress but celestina no longer heeded the beauties that surrounded her hers was now that state of mind when tis naught but gloom around the darkened sun loses his light the rosy bosomed spring to weeping fancy pines and yon bright arch contracted bends into a dusky vault all nature fades extinct even flowers of which she was passionately fond had lost the influence they once had over her fancy she saw them not or seeing them only recollected that willoughby had shown her at alverston 
a bed of such hyacinths whose bloom and fragrance he had fondly anticipated knowing how much she delighted in them she remembered with a sigh each particular leaf and blossom that composed the last nosegay he gathered for her on the morning of that day when they were divided never as she now feared to meet again such were her sad recollections as hardly knowing what she did she traversed the grass walk which was divided by a hedge of evergreens from the road her mournful reverie was interrupted by the sound of horses feet she flew to the gate it was cathcart who on perceiving her threw himself from his horse and gave her the long expected letter which she received with such marks of extreme agitation that cathcart afraid she would fall left his horse to find its way to the stable and came to support her she leaned on his arm attempting to speak and after a moment's pause said cathcart you have had a letter also i have before i have courage to open my own tell me is willoughby well and are there hopes of our seeing him again he is well answered cathcart but of seeing him again he gives me no hopes to you perhaps he may be and i hope is more explicit celestina stayed not to reply but hurrying as well as she was able to her own room tore open her letter which was in these words london april three seventeen eighty eight what must be the misery the man endures who only a few days since had the immediate prospect of calling celestina his and who is now compelled not only to leave her but to leave her uncertain whether he may ever again dare to entertain that hope whether he shall ever see her more how i have loved you celestina how i still love you i surely need not repeat this passion you well know grew with my growth and strengthened with my strength you will not therefore believe that any circumstance can diminish any time efface it yet such are the barriers that may be between us that perhaps i may never dare again to see you or only when i have submitted to the dreadful sacrifice required of me and given my hand to one to whom my heart must ever be a stranger and yet celestina if to this i ever do submit it will only be to enable me to place you in the situation you deserve as to fortune and because it matters not if i cannot pass my life with you with whom it may be my destiny to pass it for then it must in every event be equally unhappy celestina i am aware of the appearance my conduct must have in your eyes aware of it without having the power to explain it i have sworn that i will not unveil this fatal mystery till i either can see you with all those delicious hopes unimpoisoned that were so lately mine or till i have learned to regard you not with less affection for that is impossible but with i bewilder myself i know not what i would say only let this be understood as my meaning that wherever i may be or whatever i may become my fondest affections my love my esteem must be yours it is more than probable that i shall go abroad and you celestina whither will you go suffer me to name my wishes though i hardly dare hope you will comply with them why should you not stay at alverston if ever i return to it you will be its mistress if i never return you might find a melancholy pleasure but again i am wandering from my point i will not dictate to you my lovely friend i who am incapable of judging what i ought to do for myself 
for in the midst of my reflections a thousand bitter possibilities distract me celestina may renounce me as unworthy of her may learn to despise me or what is yet more dreadful she may learn to love another <gasps> celestina should this ever happen should you ever give that heart which it was the glory of my life to possess to another and yet situated as i may find myself it may perhaps be but i must conclude while i am able and call off my thoughts from myself to promote celestina's future comforts if i can yet contribute to it who have perhaps been its destroyer do not write to me expressions of your anxiety and regret i cannot bear it is as much as i can now do to keep my senses gracious heaven that ever i should say to celestina do not write to me cathcart has my directions how to act in all pecuniary matters at alverston and to stay in the house till he takes possession of his own which i suppose will be as soon as old winnington dies then he will continue to superintend the farm and to receive the rents out of which i have directed him to pay you fifty guineas every quarter and to answer any further demands that you may make upon him and you must not celestina refuse this for remember that the master of the whole fortune should now have been yours and that you have a right to this trifle perhaps to much more but if these reasons are insufficient to conquer your reluctance remember celestina that willoughby the unhappy willoughby asks it of you with the greatest alleviation his wretchedness now admits of wherever you are let cathcart give me constant information and whenever i can tell you that the weight which now presses on my heart is removed i will write write no i will then fly to my celestina from the extremity of the earth perhaps i may now be in a few days on the sea but i go no farther but to the south of europe celestina it would be a very great comfort to me to hear from cathcart before i go what you intend to do it would be a still greater to know that you determine to remain at least this summer at alverston but you are now with a most excellent man who is capable of advising you in him celestina you will have a friend and protector oh why is it my lot to refer you to another for protection when to be your friend your lover your husband was so lately the first hope as it has ever been the first wish of my existence but i am running again into useless repetition celestina if i ever seemed worthy of your regard give not away hastily those affections which were mine if ever i can claim them again we may be happy if not but i cannot finish the sentence i know not what i would write nor am i able to read over what i have written may god bless and protect you adieu dearest celestina george willoughby celestina read over this letter the first time in such perturbation that except a general notion that notwithstanding willoughby had involuntarily left her they should meet no more she had very little idea of its contents hers were sensations of anguish which no appeal to friendship no participation of her sentiments with another could mitigate or appease cathcart knew no more of the motives of willoughby's conduct than she did herself mr thorold was equally ignorant and to neither of them could she look for consolation she tried to recover her composure she a second time read the letter it grew more and more inexplicable and after having anxiously waited for it so many days its arrival seemed now only either to embarrass her with new conjectures or to torment her with apprehensions of his marrying miss fitzhaman for to that the close of the first sentence evidently alluded 
nothing but the natural strength of her understanding could have supported her under the first tumultuous sensations of redoubled consternation and wild conjecture which now assailed her the longer she studied the letter the more impossible she found any explanation of willoughby's conduct still the assurances of his unshaken attachment sweetened the bitterness of her destiny he was living he still loved her her situation therefore however uneasy was not desperate and as the first astonishment at the incomprehensible contents of a letter which was expected to clear up every doubt subsided she saw less cause of despondence and again she examined every separate paragraph trying to extract from all that would bear it something to cherish that hope without which her existence would have been insupportable every request of willoughby had with her the force of a command but that he made in regard to her continuing at alverston was so worded as if he hardly himself thought she ought to comply with it the impropriety of it appeared evident but in every other instance she determined to be governed by his wishes and as far as was now in her power to contribute to his satisfaction by affording him all the consolation that depended upon her of the pleasure of living for a beloved object though perhaps personally disunited for ever of believing that wherever he was her ease and happiness were ever in his thoughts she was fully sensible and she now found in it a consolation so soothing to her mind that she was soon enabled to return to cathcart who waited for her in the parlour with more composure than on her leaving him it was likely she would soon obtain she found herself unequal to entering on a discussion of the letter which she gave to cathcart to read and on his returning it in silence but with a look sufficiently expressive of his astonishment she told him that nothing remained but for them to fulfil as nearly as possible all the injunctions of willoughby he desires me not to write to him said she even in that i shall with whatever reluctance obey him at present and so i certainly shall in what relates to following the advice of mr thorold a little time will be necessary before i can fix on any plan of life but as my dear willoughby expects to hear of me from you tell him that i bear our separation cruel as it is with fortitude and calmness convinced as i am that our connection is not broken by any cause that ought to make me blush that it had ever been intended she stopped a moment to recover her voice which faltered and almost failed and then added no cathcart whatever has divided us i have the firmest reliance on willoughby's honour and on his love said cathcart you may dear madam with equal firmness rely and though these perfect convictions render this strange separation more wonderful they will i trust sustain your courage through it i say through it because i am almost certain it will be of no long duration ah cathcart cried celestina mournfully i would i could think so but it is indeed very fruitless and very painful to enter again on these bewildering conjectures in which as there is no end there is little use and i have need of all my spirits to enable me to support an evil for which i cannot account i will not therefore waste them in guessing or lamenting but employ them to obey him to whom my heart must in every change of circumstance and though i were certain never more to see him be fondly and faithfully devoted tell him so my good friend tell him how well i bear this severe blow more severe as coming from an unknown hand and assure him that if he will allow me to write to him i will not distress him by useless complaints or aggravate his sorrow by representing my own again she stopped while cathcart expressed his admiration of her just and noble resolutions 
and after a moment finding the exertion too much for her she added hastily tell him thus much cathcart in the letter you will of course write to him this afternoon and tell him that your next letter shall inform him if it is still uneasy to him to receive a letter from me of the arrangements i will make under the guidance of mr thorold for my future life but say that they will be such as will render his generous intentions as to pecuniary matters needless i would fain explain my thoughts in that respect but in truth i am not able just now some hours of reflection will be necessary to me farewell therefore dear cathcart for this morning i shall of course see you again in a few days cathcart assured her he would be with her again the following friday or the intervening day if he received any new intelligence from willoughby she then charged him with many kind wishes and remembrances to jessie who was now he told her so confined by her grandfather that she could not get to her and then took his leave to return to alverston and execute the wishes of willoughby by giving him a minute detail of all that had passed with celestina end of chapter two volume two chapter three of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer painter celestina by charlotte turner smith volume two chapter three mr thorold who was informed that celestina had received letters from willoughby felt a true friendly impatience to know their contents but feeling also how much his lovely guest must in any event be agitated he not only forbore to intrude upon her with any inquiries himself but in order that she might not suffer even from the looks of his family which he knew could not fail to express solicitude arising from less generous motives he sent her up a note to her own apartment in which he begged she would not come down to dinner to put herself through form into any situation that might be in any degree painful this exemption was particularly gratifying to her as the younger thorold was this day expected at dinner and was to remain at home for some weeks and his elder brother a captain in the army who had been some time in ireland was to meet him in the evening celestina was unfit for company and above all the company of strangers and again she regretted that in the first unsettled tumult of her spirits she had agreed to mr thorold's proposal instead of going back to the lodgings she had formerly inhabited she was now however compelled to remain where she was till she could determine with the advice of mr thorold whither to go she thought it probable that he might wish her to remain with him but to this except his friendly regard for her and the advantage of being near cathcart and jessie she had no inducement and wherever she was she determined it should not be as a mere visitor for any length of time but that she would pay for her board again the quiet and liberty of her cottage on the heath recurred to her but when she enjoyed that quiet her heart had not undergone those vicissitudes of happiness and misery which had now she greatly feared excluded tranquillity from her bosom for ever what had then afforded her a species of melancholy pleasure the distant view of a spot in alverston park would now serve only to render her more unhappy and to encourage that tendency to repine which her reason told her she should both on willoughby's account and her own rather resolve to conquer than endeavour to indulge she believed however that if once some resolution was formed as to her future residence she should be easier herself and be better able to satisfy willoughby to this subject therefore she turned her thoughts and examined with a heavy heart several different plans that offered themselves to her mind 
nothing could be more comfortless than her reflections she was not only an orphan and a stranger in england but knew not whether there was in the world any being whose protection she had the remotest right to claim lady molyneux had never written to her since their separation and even if willoughby should approve of her again seeking the protection of his sister which she had great reason to doubt she knew not whether matilda and her husband would receive her and from that want of heart she had too often discovered in them both she could not think of making the experiment she had no intimacy with any other person for though many of the families she had been accustomed to visit while mrs willoughby lived had daughters who had cultivated an acquaintance with her she had already seen enough of the general conduct of the world to know that she should now be no longer an acceptable guest and that an individual to whom court is made assiduously while shining as an equal among fashionable circles is soon forgotten or if remembered despised when those adventitious advantages surround her no longer she had heard from vavasour for willoughby himself had always carefully avoided the subject that the sudden desertion of miss fitzhaman to whom willoughby was supposed to be so firmly engaged and his resolution of marrying his mother's adopted daughter had been very much talked of in the extensive circle who were connected or acquainted with the family she could not doubt but their sudden separation on the very eve of their marriage was as generally known and had she found any temptation to return to the society she had quitted this painful certainty the prying curiosity that would be excited and the malicious conjecture that would be made would effectually have counteracted it towards evening she found sufficient courage to entreat mr thorold's attention for half an hour he came to her immediately and she put into his hands the letter she had received from willoughby he read it with great attention and as it should seem with great concern and then in the expressive manner that was usual with him gave it back to her without speaking benevolence and pity were now visible in his features which were masculine strong and frequently stern but celestina was hardly enough accustomed to him to understand his silence completely you see dear sir said she timidly you see that willoughby refers me to you and i would very fain avail myself of the benefit of your advice it is always at your service replied mr thorold but on what occasion do you now ask it i wish to know replied she with still greater hesitation what you think it advisable for me to do where you think i ought to settle myself i am sorry answered he you think it so soon necessary to turn your thoughts that way i hoped that you would stay here at least for some weeks and really i can give you no other advice than to do so the mystery which i cannot develop may by that time be removed and we shall have time not only to hear more of willoughby but if nothing occurs on his part to re-establish you at alveston to cast about for a proper and permanent situation for you think no more therefore my dear ward for such i consider you of leaving us at present and rather exert your admirable understanding in quieting your spirits and in acquiring fortitude to bear adversity and evil if they should be finally your portion or equality of temper to enjoy what it is more difficult to enjoy well happiness and prosperity celestina would now have spoken of the inconvenience to which so long a visit might put his family and the little claim she had to such unusual kindness from him and mrs thorold but he suffered her not to continue these apologies seemed little pleased that she attempted to make them and then reassuming his good humour he left her bidding her try to recover her looks and to dismiss as much as she could from her mind the distressing events of the last ten days celestina now found that she could not immediately remove 
without offending the friend to whom Willoughby had recommended her, and prepared, since she could not be indulged with solitude, to mix with his family, and be as little as possible a weight on those who, whatever might be their good humour, could not be expected to enter into her sorrows. The next morning, therefore, at breakfast, she joined Mrs. Thorold, her daughter, and her two sons, to both of whom she was immediately introduced, and from whose scrutinising looks she sought refuge in talking with forced cheerfulness to Arabella. Captain Thorold was the eldest of the family, and Montague the youngest. The former of these young men had been adopted by his uncle, who, after a life passed in the army, had died a general officer at a very advanced age, and had left his nephew his whole fortune, which was near fifteen hundred a year, after the death of his wife, who surviving him only a twelve-month, Captain Thorold had now been some time in possession of his estate, and of a considerable sum of money. But accustomed from his infancy to the unsettled life of a soldier, he still continued it from habit and choice, and though his father and his family were very solicitous to have him marry and settle near them, he seemed to have no inclination to resign his freedom for the pleasures of domestic society. Novelty and amusement were his pursuits, and his fortune gave him the power to indulge himself. He had what is generally called a very handsome person, but without his military air his figure would have been rather esteemed clumsy than graceful. He had lived much among the circles who give the ton, dressed well, and had that sort of understanding which recommended him to general society, and particularly to that of the ladies, with whom he was an almost universal favourite, and who had agreed to call him the handsome Thorold, even before he became possessed of a fortune, which in the opinion of most of the bells at country quarters, and still more in the opinion of their mothers, more than redoubled his attractions. Thus spoiled from his first entrance into life, he had learned to consider himself as irresistible, and supposed every woman he saw his own, if he chose to take the trouble of securing her. His air and manner were tinctured with the consequence he derived from this persuasion, and from having indulged himself in the cruel vanity of extensive conquest, he was incapable of any lasting or serious attachment. At the first public meeting at any town he happened to be quartered at, he elected some goddess of the day. With her he danced, he walked, he rode, he coquetted, and by studied looks and tender speeches soon persuaded the inexperienced girl that she had secured in her chains the handsome Thorold. The delusion of the young woman herself, and the envy of the contemporary bells, sometimes lasted till the removal of the corps to another station, when he took a cold farewell, and left her to suffer all the pain of disappointed love and mortified vanity. But he not unfrequently indulged himself in witnessing the distress this wanton folly inflicted, and after some days of attention so marked and unequivocal as to give the lady reason to suppose an absolute declaration of his passion was certainly to be expected, he suddenly broke off the acquaintance, pretended to forget their intimacy, bowed to her when they met with the air of a stranger, and beginning the same career with some other pretty girl of the place, he affected to treat with disdain and wonder the reports he had himself raised of his permanent attachment to the first lady, and laughed with her rival at the melancholy moping looks or glances of angry disappointment of the deserted beauty, declaring himself amazed at her having the vanity to suppose him serious, because he had shown her a few trifling attentions which meant nothing. This conduct of his son had given Mr. Thorold great uneasiness a few years before, but lately, as he had been in Ireland, and in very distant quarters, his father had heard no more of it, and flattered himself that now, at near thirty, this unsettled temper and unjustifiable levity would end in his marrying and quitting the army. 
but though a very fond father to all his children mr thorold loved the captain less than the others partly perhaps because he was so early removed from him and rendered independent of his care and partly because his temper and disposition resembled not his own while mrs thorold doted on her eldest son whose figure and fortune gratified her vanity and whom she thought no young woman could possibly deserve unless she possessed at once fortune beauty and fashion montague thorold who was but just turned of one and twenty and was designed by his father for the church was as modest and unassuming as his brother was arrogant and pretending he was a very good scholar with a passion for poetry and was just of the age to be in love with every handsome woman he saw and without having the courage to speak to any of them in prose he celebrated his divinities in verse and sighed forth his tender sentiments in sonnets and elegies which enriched the magazines and now and then the public prints under the fictitious names of alfonso or lysimachus such were the two young men who were now added to the tea-table of mrs thorold where all the family were assembled except mr thorold himself who always breakfasted early and then went out to his farm or among his parishioners mrs thorold had told her sons that a young lady was visiting at the house whose history she had given them in shorthand describing her as a dependent on the late mrs willoughby whom her son had very simply intended to marry at alverston but the evening before the appointed wedding day had broken off the match from prudential motives as she supposed and by the advice of some of his friends who had come down from london this was the idea mrs thorold had herself conceived of the affair and she had no means of being undeceived for mr thorold who knew that with her a command was better than an argument and whose authority was pretty firmly established had ordered her positively to ask no questions of his guest and had peremptorily refused to answer those she put to himself she obeyed but not without many murmurs but knowing that mr thorold would be much disobliged by her refusal to entertain celestina with kindness had put a restraint upon herself and showed her hitherto much civility though not without many complaints to arabella when they were alone of her father's absurdity in forcing people into the family and refusing even to satisfy her who and what they were or what claim they had to the kindness he exacted for them from his mother's sketch of their visitor the evening before captain thorold had very little curiosity to see her and montague whose heart was in one of its most violent paroxysms of love for the fair daughter of an attorney at henley with whom he became acquainted about a fortnight before was occupied in composing an elegy on absence and thought he could with indifference have beheld at that period helen herself he had inquired of his mother and sister if their guest was handsome mrs thorold answered no not at all handsome in my opinion and arabella said yes surely mamma she is rather prettyish on her entering the room however both the gentlemen were instantly of an opinion very different from that of their mother and their sister yet celestina had not now that dazzling complexion or that animated countenance which were once so dangerous to behold she was pale and languid her eyes had all their softness but their lustre was diminished and the enchanting sweetness which used to play about her mouth was now supplied by a melancholy smile the effect of a faint effort to conceal the anguish of the heart such as she now appeared however the captain thought her very lovely and montague almost instantly forgot the nymph for whom he had been dying in song all the morning and saw in the interesting languor of celestina in her faded cheek and downcast eyes a sentimental effect which none of the fair creatures whom he had celebrated had ever so eminently possessed but if such were his sentiments before she spoke 
his admiration arose to extravagance when after breakfast his sister engaged her in a walk in which the two gentlemen attended them and when he found that her mind corresponded with the elegance of her form that she was very well read had a taste for poetry and understood italian of which he was enthusiastically fond captain thorold on whom these advantages made less impression was not quite pleased during this walk with the unusual talkativeness of his brother who generally suffered him to take the lead in conversation he now attempted to put by him two or three times and to relate anecdotes of people in high life of what general wallace said to him at dublin castle upon his introduction to the duchess of and of a bon mot of lady mary marsden's at supper one evening but celestina who cared nothing about the general the duchess or lady mary let the conversation drop without expressing any pleasure in it and again lent her attention to montague who desired her to correct his accent while he repeated o oh, primavera gioventu del anno celestina modestly assured him she was incapable of correcting him but he besought her so earnestly to recite the lines to him that she inconsiderately attempted it and in the most enchanting accents began o oh, primavera gioventu del anno bella madre di fiori derbe novelle e di novelli amori tu torni ben ma teco non tornano i serini e fortunati di delle mie giogi the cruel remembrance that now pressed upon her heart made her voice tremble and gave it additional tenderness she tried to recover it and going into a lower tone went on with tu torni ben tu torni ma teco altro non torna che del perduto mio caro tesoro lo rimembranza misera e dolente she could go no farther the tears were in her eyes but she tried to smile and to stifle the deep sigh that was rising as she said i cannot go on for really i remember no more the young man fascinated by her manner and her voice now recollected with reluctance recollected that these seducing tones were drawn forth by the reality of those sufferings the poet described he looked at her in silence and as he marked the sad and pensive expression that remained on her countenance that astonishment which he had hardly time to feel before arose he thought it impossible that mr willoughby having the power to marry such a woman and having once formed the resolution to do so should by any persuasions be diverted from his purpose and he found that in the single hour he had been with her he admired her enough to sacrifice everything to her were it possible that her regard could be transferred to him the improbability that it ever could struck him forcibly and rendered him as silent as celestina herself while the captain who had now an opportunity of engrossing her attention rallied her on being so much affected i have no notion now said he of giving way to those sorts of things i love gay and cheerful poetry one is tired of weeping at the fictitious misery of fictitious persons i remember being some time ago at a conversation in dublin where we talked of the fashionable indifference which everybody has now for tragedy and my friend hargrave who has written you know several things himself was condemning it as the certain marks of the vitiated taste and imbecility of the age i took up the argument on the other side and lady mary marsden thought as i did indeed everybody present allowed that it was quite absurd to go to a play which is intended to amuse and entertain only to be made uneasy she agreed with me that people have concerns enough in real life and need not go seek it in way of diversion and did her ladyship 
inquired montague thorold give no other reasons i think those are very good reasons replied the captain they might be so answered his brother for a woman of fashion but i am persuaded literary people and people of taste think quite otherwise and the ancients whose superior intellectual advantages are not to be disputed oh prithee montague interrupted the captain don't run us down with college cant oh, i'm talking of the world we live in and the opinions of people who lived two thousand years ago are no more in question now than their dresses he then went on to retail other opinions of lady mary marsden who was as it seemed the oracle of the hour in the society he had just left celestina heard him with apparent attention but in truth without knowing what he said his brother rendered impatient by being interrupted in his conversation with her walked away and arabella who loved to hear descriptions of fine people and to attend to fashionable conversations kept up the dialogue till the end of their walk when celestina went to her own room arabella to her dressing-table and the captain finding his mother at work in the parlour thought he had a right to ask her a few questions about celestina in return for the perpetual tone of interrogation she had kept up towards him ever since his arrival to mrs thorold the next gratification to that of asking questions was the pleasure of answering them she told her son therefore not only all she knew but invented answers on some points which she only guessed at and he understood from her information that celestina had been very partial to willoughby and so strong was this partiality described that he began to doubt whether the proposed marriage had not been a mere finesse to throw her off her guard and get her wholly into his power and whether his abrupt departure had not been in consequence of the success of this disingenuous but not unprecedented method of proceeding captain thorold had seen willoughby frequently in his last visit at home and knew that he had every advantage which a fine person and engaging manners could give him he was well acquainted with the society among which he lived and had heard some of them but particularly vavasour described as being very gay and unprincipled he had therefore little difficulty in supposing that willoughby resembled those with whom he associated and that celestina had been the victim of those arts which he supposed no man ever scrupled to practise where the object was so well worth the trouble especially one so unprotected as she was where no rigid father was in the way to obstruct their designs or chamon like brother to avenge the wrong they might commit willoughby now however seemed quite out of the question and he doubted not but that after a short interval given to sentimental regret on the loss of a first lover she would listen to other vows and encourage the passion which he thought it might be very amusing to entertain her with without meaning however to offer himself to fill such engagements as willoughby had broken while he meditated on this project he could not help smiling at the gullibility of his father who had thus he thought taken into his protection and made the companion of his wife and daughter the deserted mistress of willoughby End of chapter three